If you enjoy what you're hearing, don't forget to hit like and subscribe so we can find each other again in future. And if you want to support the channel further, please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Hello there, my name is John, and I'm here to bring you a sleep story. So find some place comfortable, lie back, let your arms and legs fall slack at your sides, take a deep breath, and close your eyes. Tonight, we check back in with the Pevensey children and their adventure to another world. As we continue with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C. S. Lewis. Chapter 9 In the Witch's House. And now, of course, you want to know what happened to Edmund. He had eaten his share of the dinner, but he hadn't really enjoyed it, because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food, half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation, and hadn't enjoyed it much either, because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him, and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver told them about Aslan, and until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table. It was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door, for the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, just as it gave the others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle, and just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them that the White Witch wasn't really human at all, but half a djinn and half a giantess, Edmund had got outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he had actually wanted his brother and sisters to be turned into stone. He did want Turkish delight, and to be a prince, and later a king, and to pay Peter out for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do with the others, he didn't want to be particularly nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself. But he managed to believe, or to pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them. Because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me, anyway, much nicer than they are. I expect she is the rightful queen, really. Anyway, she'll be better than that awful Aslan. At least, That was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside him he really knew that the White Witch was bad and cruel. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling all around him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house, and of course there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone, for it had been nearly three o'clock when they sat down to dinner, and the winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it, so he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam. Luckily it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen, to the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute, and what with that and the snowflakes swirling all around him, he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then there was no road. He kept slipping into deep drifts of snow, and skidding on frozen puddles, and tripping over fallen tree trunks, and sliding down steep banks, and barking his shins against rocks, he was wet and cold and bruised all over. 
The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others if he hadn't happened to say to himself, When I'm king of Narnia, the first thing I shall do will be to make some decent roads. And of course, that set him off thinking about being a king and all the other things he would do, and this cheered him up a great deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have, and how many cars, and all about his private cinema, and where the principal railways would run, and what laws he would make against beavers and dams, and was putting the finishing touches to some scheme for keeping Peter in his place, when the weather changed. First the snow stopped, then a wind sprang up, and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled away, and the moon came out. It was a full moon, and shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day, only the shadows were rather confusing. He would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out by the time he got to the other river. You remember he had seen, when they first arrived at the beavers, a smaller river, flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up. But the little valley down which it came was much steeper and rockier than the one he had just left, and much overgrown with bushes, so that he could not have managed it at all in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through, for he had to stoop to go under branches, and great loads of snow came sliding off onto his back. And every time this happened, he thought more and more how he hated Peter, just as if all this had been Peter's fault. But at last he came to a part where it was more level, and the valley opened out. And there, on the other side of the river, quite close to him, in the middle of a little plain between two hills, he saw what must be the white witch's house, and the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. They looked like huge dunces caps or sorcerers caps, and they shone in the moonlight, and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house, but it was too late to think of turning back now. He crossed the river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deep, newly fallen snow. He walked on and on, past corner after corner of the house, and past turret after turret to find the door. He had to go right round to the far side before he found it. It was a huge arch, but the great iron gates stood wide open, Edmund crept up to the arch and looked inside into the courtyard, and there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just beside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion, crouched as if it was ready to spring. And Edmund stood in the shadow of the arch, afraid to go on and afraid to go back, with his knees knocking together. He stood there so long that his teeth would have been chattering with cold, even if they had not been chattering with fear. How long this really lasted, I don't know. But it seemed to Edmund to last for hours. Then at last he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing that it couldn't have been looking at him at all. But supposing it turns his head, thought Edmund. In fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it, about four feet away. 
Aha, thought Edmund. When it springs at the dwarf, then will be my chance to escape. But still the lion never moved, nor did the dwarf. And now at last Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion. And as soon as he had thought of that, he noticed that the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow. Of course it must be only a statue. No living animal would have let itself get covered with snow. Then, very slowly, and with his heart beating as if it would burst, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now he hardly dared to touch it, but at last he put out his hand, very quickly, and did. It was cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over, down to his toes. And at the same time, there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan that they were all talking about. She's caught him already and turned him into stone. So that's the end of all their fine ideas about him. Who? Who's afraid of Aslan? And he stood there gloating over the stone lion, and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip and then a pair of spectacles on its eyes. Then he said, Yeah, silly old Aslan, how do you like being a stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it, the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad and noble, staring up in the moonlight, that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of jeering at it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. As he got into the middle of it, he saw that there were dozens of statues all about, standing here and there, rather as the pieces stand on a chessboard when it is halfway through the game. There were some satyrs and stone wolves and bears and foxes and catamountains of stone. There were lovely stone shapes that looked like women who were really the spirits of trees. There was the great shape of a centaur and a winged horse and a long, lithe creature that Edmund took to be a dragon. They all looked so strange standing there perfectly lifelike and so perfectly still, in the bright, cold moonlight, that it was eerie work crossing the courtyard. Right in the very middle stood a huge shape like a man, but as tall as a tree, with a fierce face and shaggy beard and great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant and not a live one, Edmund did not like going past it. He now saw that there was a dim light showing from a doorway on the far side of the courtyard. He went to it. There was a flight of stone steps going up to an open door. Edmund went up to them. Across the threshold lay a great wolf. It's all right. It's all right, he kept saying to himself. It's only a stone wolf. It can't hurt me. And he raised his leg to step over it. Instantly the huge creature rose, with all the hair bristling along its back, opened a great red mouth, and said in a growling voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. If you please, sir, said Edmund, trembling so that he could hardly speak. My name is Edmund, and I'm the son of Adam that Her Majesty met in the wood the other day, and I've come to bring her the news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia, quite close, in the beaver's house. She... she wanted to see them. I will tell Her Majesty, said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand still on the threshold as you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood and waited. 
his fingers aching with cold, and his heart pounding in his chest. And presently, the grey wolf, Fenris Ulf, the chief of the witch's secret police, came bounding back and said, Come in, come in, fortunate favorite of the queen, or else not so fortunate. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long, gloomy hall with many pillars, full as the courtyard had been, of statues. The one nearest the door was a little fawn with a very sad expression on its face, and Edmund couldn't help wondering if this might be Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close behind this sat the white witch. I'm come, your majesty, said Edmund, rushing eagerly forward. How dare you come alone, said the witch in a terrible voice. Did I not tell you to bring the others with you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund. I've done the best I can. I've brought them quite close. They're in the little house on top of the dam, just up the river, with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. A slow, cruel smile came over the witch's face. Is this all your news? she asked. No, your majesty, said Edmund, and proceeded to tell her all he had heard before leaving the beaver's house. What? Aslan? cried the queen. Aslan, is this true? If I find you have lied to me, then please, I am only repeating what they said, stammered Edmund. But the queen, who was no longer attending to him, clapped her hands. Instantly, the same dwarf whom Edmund had seen with her before appeared. Make ready our sledge, ordered the witch, and use the harness without bells. Chapter 10 The Spell Begins to Break Now we must go back to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver and the three other children. As soon as Mr. Beaver said, There's no time to lose, everyone began bundling themselves into coats, except Mrs. Beaver, who started picking up sacks and laying them on the table, and said, Now, Mr. Beaver, just reach down that ham, and here's a packet of tea, and there's sugar, and some matches, and if someone will get two or three loaves out of the crock over there in the corner... What are you doing, Mrs. Beaver? exclaimed Susan. Packing a load for each of us, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver very coolly. You didn't think we'd set out on a journey with nothing to eat, did you? But we haven't time, said Susan, buttoning the collar of her coat. She may be here any minute. That's what I say, chimed in Mr. Beaver. Get along with you all, said his wife. Think it over, Mr. Beaver. She can't be here for a quarter of an hour at least. But don't we want as big of a start as we can possibly get? said Peter. If we're to reach the stone table before her. You've got to remember that, Mrs. Beaver said Susan. As soon as she has looked in here and finds we're all gone, she'll be off at top speed. That she will, said Mrs. Beaver, but we can't get there before her whatever we do, for she'll be on a sledge and we'll be walking. Then have we no hope? said Susan. Now don't get fussing, there's a dear, said Mrs. Beaver, but just get half a dozen clean handkerchiefs out of that drawer. Of course we've got a hope. We can't get there before her, but we can keep under cover and go by ways she won't expect, and perhaps we'll get through. That's true enough, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband, but it's time we were out of this. And don't you start fussing either, Mr. Beaver, said his wife. There, that's better. There's four loads, and the smallest for the smallest of us. That's you, my dear, she added looking at Lucy. Oh, do please come on, said Lucy. Well, I'm nearly ready now, answered Mrs. Beaver at last, allowing her husband to help her into her snow boots. I suppose the sewing machine's too heavy to bring? Yes, it is, said Mr. Beaver. A great deal too heavy. 
and you don't think you'll be able to use it while we're on the run, I suppose? I can't abide the thought of that witch fiddling with it, said Mrs. Beaver, and breaking it or stealing it, as likely as not. Oh, please, please, please do hurry, said the three children. And so at last they all got outside, and Mr. Beaver locked the door. It'll delay her a bit, he said, and they set off all carrying their loads over their shoulders. The snow had stopped, and the moon had come out when they began their journey. They went in single file, first Mr. Beaver, then Lucy, then Peter, then Susan, and Mrs. Beaver last of all. Mr. Beaver led them across the dam and onto the right bank of the river, and then along a very rough sort of path among the trees right down by the river bank, and the sides of the valley, shining in the moonlight, towered up far above them on either hand. Best keep down here as much as possible, he said. She'll have to keep to the top, for you couldn't bring a sledge down here. It would have been a pretty enough scene to look at through a window from a comfortable armchair. And even as things were, Lucy enjoyed it at first. But as they went on walking and walking and walking, and as the sack she was carrying felt heavier and heavier, she began to wonder how she was going to keep up at all. And she stopped looking at the dazzling brightness of the frozen river, with all its waterfalls of ice, and at the white masses of the treetops, and the great glaring moon, and the countless stars, and could only watch the little short legs of Mr. Beaver going pad, 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 through the snow, in front of her, as if they were never going to stop. Then the moon disappeared, and the snow began to fall once more, and at last Lucy was so tired that she was almost asleep and walking at the same time, when suddenly she found that Mr. Beaver had turned away from the river bank to the right, and was leading them steeply uphill into the very thickest bushes, and then, as she came fully awake, she found that Mr. Beaver was just vanishing into a little hole in the bank, which had been almost hidden under the bushes, until you were quite on top of it. In fact, by the time she realized what was happening, only his short flat tail was showing. Lucy immediately stooped down and crawled in after him. Then she heard noises of scrambling and puffing and panting behind her, and in a moment all five of them were inside. "'Wherever is this?' said Peter's voice, sounding tired and pale in the darkness. "'I hope you know what I mean by a voice sounding pale. "'It's an old hiding place for beavers in bad times,' said Mr. Beaver, "'and a great secret. It's not much of a place, but we must get a few hours sleep.' If you hadn't all been in such a plaguy fuss when we were starting, I'd have brought some pillows, said Mrs. Beaver. It wasn't nearly such a nice cave as Mr. Tumnus's, Lucy thought. Just a hole in the ground, but dry and earthy. It was very small so that when they all lay down, they were all a bundle of fur and clothes together. And what with that and being warmed up by their long walk, they were really rather snug. If only the floor of the cave had been a little smoother. Then Mrs. Beaver handed round in the dark a little flask, out of which everyone drank something. It made one cough and splutter a little, and stung the throat, but it also made you feel deliciously warm after you'd swallowed it, and everyone went straight to sleep. It seemed to Lucy only the next minute though really it was hours and hours later, when she woke up feeling a little cold and dreadfully stiff and thinking how she would like a hot bath. Then she felt a set of long whiskers tickling her cheek and saw the cold daylight coming in through the mouth of the cave. But immediately after that, she was very wide awake indeed, and so was everyone else. In fact, they were all sitting up with their mouths and eyes wide open, listening to a sound, which was the very sound they'd all been thinking of, 
and sometimes imagining they heard during their walk last night. It was the sound of jingling bells. Mr. Beaver was out of the cave like a flash the moment he heard it. Perhaps, you think, as Lucy thought for a moment, that this was a very silly thing for him to do. But it was really a very sensible one. He knew he could scramble to the top of the bank among the bushes and brambles without being seen, and he wanted above all things to see which way the witch's sledge went. The others all sat in the cave, waiting and wondering. They waited nearly five minutes. Then they heard something that frightened them very much. They heard voices. Oh, thought Lucy, he's been seen. She's caught him. Great was their surprise when, a little later, they heard Mr. Beaver's voice calling to them from just outside the cave. It's all right, he was shouting. Come out, Mrs. Beaver. Come out, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. It's all right. It isn't her. This was bad grammar, of course. But that is how beavers talk when they are excited. I mean, in Narnia. In our world, they usually don't talk at all. So Mrs. Beaver and the children came bundling out of the cave, all blinking in the daylight, and with earth all over them, and looking very frousty and unbrushed and uncombed, and with the sleep in their eyes. Come on, cried Mr. Beaver, who was almost dancing with delight. Come and see. This is a nasty knock for the witch. It looks as if her power was already crumbling. What do you mean, Mr. Beaver? panted Peter, as they all scrambled up the steep bank of the valley together. Didn't I tell you, answered Mr. Beaver, that she'd made it always winter and never Christmas. Didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. And then they were all at the top and did see. It was a sledge and it was reindeer with bells on their harness. But they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer, and they were not white, but brown. And on the sledge sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood that had fur inside it, and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him because, though you see people of his sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it is rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly. But now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. I've come at last, said he. She has kept me out for a long time. But I have got in at last. Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness which you only get if you are being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presence, there is a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs. Beaver. I will drop it in your house as I pass. If you please, sir, said Mrs. Beaver, making a curtsy. It's locked up. Locks and bolts make no difference to me, said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr. Beaver, when you get home, you will find your dam finished and mended and all the leaks stopped and a new sluice gate fitted. Mr. Beaver was so pleased that he opened his mouth very wide and then found he couldn't say anything at all. Peter, Adam's son, said Father Christmas. Here, sir, 
said Peter. These are your presents, was the answer, and they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color of silver, and across it there ramped a red lion, as bright as a ripe strawberry at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was of gold, and it had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed, and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. Susan, Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas, these are for you. And he handed her a bow and a quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. You must use the bow only in great need, he said, for I do not mean you to fight in the battle. It does not easily miss. And when you put this horn to your lips and blow it, then, wherever you are, I think help of some kind will come to you. Last of all, he said, Lucy, Eve's daughter. And Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle of what looked like glass, but people said afterward that it was made of diamond and a small dagger. In this bottle, he said, there is a cordial made of the juice of one of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends are hurt, a few drops of this will restore you, and the dagger is to defend yourself at great need, for you also are not to be in the battle. Why, sir, said Lucy, I think, I don't know, but I think I could be brave enough. That's not the point, he said. But battles are ugly when women fight. And now... Here he suddenly looked less grave. Here is something for the moment for you all. And he brought out, I suppose from the big bag at his back, but nobody quite saw him do it, a large tray containing five cups and saucers, a bowl of lump sugar, a jug of cream, and a great big teapot all sizzling and piping hot. Then he cried out, A Merry Christmas! Long live the true king! And cracked his whip, and he and the reindeer and the sledge and all were out of sight before anyone realized they had started. Peter had just drawn his sword out of its sheath and was showing it to Mr. Beaver, when Mrs. Beaver said, Now then, now then, don't stand talking there till the tea's got cold. Just like men. Come and help to carry the tray down and we'll have breakfast. What a mercy I thought of bringing the bread knife. So down the steep bank they went and back to the cave. And Mr. Beaver cut some of the bread and ham into sandwiches and Mrs. Beaver poured out the tea, and everyone enjoyed himself. But long before they had finished enjoying themselves, Mr. Beaver said, Time to be moving on now. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this sleep story, feel free to leave a like and a comment. Extra special thanks goes out to my wonderful patrons, including my co-author tier patrons, Ellen Marie and Lexi What We Got. Their generous support helps keep this channel going. If you too would like to support the channel and get early access to videos, please consider joining us over at Patreon. Link is in the description. If you would like to hear more sleep stories like this, 
Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for all notifications. I upload a new story here each and every week. Thank you again for listening, and pleasant dreams. Good night.